I'm Claudia Swan, and I'm an art historian. I'm Lawrence Weschler, and I am a writer, largely of long form narrative nonfiction. <laughs> From David Zwerner, this is Dialogues, a podcast about artists and the way they think. Eight paintings that we currently think of as Vermeer's are, in fact, by Maria. It's complicated because it would entail loosening just the museum store grip on the name. It would entail thinking about the power of women. I'm Helen Molesworth, your host for this season. Every episode features a conversation with artists, curators, writers, designers, philosophers, filmmakers, and musicians about what it means to make things today. Hey, everyone. Last spring, I was lucky enough to get to see the blockbuster Vermeer exhibition at the Rijksmuseum. In preparing to see the show, I immersed myself in the Vermeer literature and learned about the controversial theory that some of his works were painted by his daughter, Maria. Writer Lawrence Weschler and art historian Claudia Swan join me today to discuss what is at stake, poetically, nationally, financially, and art historically, in the reattribution of famous paintings by the old master, especially when the new artist might be a woman. Fascinating stuff, and I hope you enjoy it. Hi, everyone. I am so happy to be uh, on the podcast today with art historian Claudia Swan and the writer Lawrence Weschler to talk about all things Vermeer. And so I wanted to gather us to talk about the Vermeer show that was recently staged by the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Uh, Vermeer is a notoriously beloved and beguiling artist. He made maybe 35, 37 works of art, uh, depending on who is doing the accounting. The Rijksmuseum was able to gather 28 of these paintings and making it the largest Vermeer show ever mounted. In its 16-week run, 650,000 people went to the museum, which is a really staggering number of people to see a group of paintings made by one individual from Delft, made several centuries ago. And so it seemed worth uh, uh, gathering some folks who know a lot about Vermeer uh, and who have written about Vermeer over time to talk about some of the things that this show brought up and didn't bring up. Vermeer is, of course, known to us as a painter of light, a painter of women, a painter of quotidian moments. People have argued for years about whether or not he achieved the kind of miraculous effects of light and its diffusion through optical devices such as a camera obscura. And much, much scholarly attention has been paid to dating the works, figuring out who the models were, and piecing together the events of Vermeer's life and career, what we have is a kind of a history of a person and their oeuvre built from fragments. And then this is further complicated because in the wake of Vermeer's death, the work falls into a kind of obscurity for about 200 years until he's kind of resurrected in the 1860s. This is not to say that he was unknown during that period. He was. People knew the work. But he didn't have the kind of a uh, unique, almost iconoclastic presence that he has uh, in our 20th and 21st century version of Vermeer, uh, which is a very different Vermeer, I think, than he maybe even experienced in his lifetime and thereafter. So I've asked uh, Lawrence and Claudia to come on the show to talk about a couple of things, and I'll telegraph them a little bit in advance. I want to talk about what they both thought about the show. I want to talk about um, the National Gallery of Arts reattribution of one of their Vermeers. So the Rijksmuseum didn't accept this reattribution, and I'd like to discuss that. And I'd like to discuss ultimately um, the art historian Benjamin Binstock's 
theory that perhaps some of the things we think of as Vermeer's were painted by his daughter, Maria Vermeer. And I wondered if you might start telling us just your impressions of the exhibition and what, if anything, it allowed you to think about Vermeer anew, since you have thought and written so much about him already. The show opened pretty spectacularly with the view of Delft, and yes. which really is a stunning work. However, where do you go from there? Right. And so from the view of Delft, the show took us, as you say, very elegantly, the, the hang was beautiful, long uh, ceiling to floor curtains, velvet curtains, into the sort of questioned paintings, the early paintings, mythological, religious paintings. And for me, this was symptomatic of the, the translation of Vermeer into a, an extraordinary, almost ineffably skilled painter of light and form, which he was, without any explicatory, explanatory, contextual information whatsoever. So I thought that there was this spectacularization of Vermeer and also a dumbing down of Vermeer and a really mm. profoundly unnecessary dumbing down of Vermeer and or his audience, because I I agree that on one hand, um, limiting the number of wall texts it serves a purpose. It directs us to the experience of looking. And on the other hand, I thought in this case, there was a, a resistance or reluctance to provide just any of the framing information that we have. What we love about Vermeer, I think, at least what I love about Vermeer is the experience of losing oneself in the in the looking, right? In the absorptive uh, practice of considering, trying to unspool the mystery of how he did it, and that is an ex solitary experience with a single painting, generally, and that is already so much. And my feeling, mm. my experience, is that to go from that experience and of one painting to 28 instances is a physiologically impossible, mentally impossible, intellectually pretty difficult without any framing information. So the National Gallery sent three paintings to this exhibition. Mm -hmm. two, two what are called to, as I believe it's pronounced, tronies, uh, which is a, a kind of portrait form, a small uh, not it's above a sketch, but not quite a full blown portrait is what I understand. And the two Tronies they sent are um, girl with the red hat or woman with the red hat and girl holding a flute. They appear to depict a woman who is maybe the same person. Um, but the team at the National Gallery no longer accepts the girl with the flute as being by Johannes Vermeer. And instead, they have said something remarkable, that it is from his studio. The problem there, it seems, uh, historically speaking, is that nobody really thought Vermeer had a studio practice up until this moment, because studio assistants, as I understand the literature, and Claudia, I'm looking to you as the, the, our academic expert at this moment, as I understand the literature, a studio assistant proper in uh, Vermeer's time would have had to have been registered with the guild so that there would have been, in fact, quite a significant civic paper trail. This does not exist. So all of a sudden to say that this might be a studio painting and the National Gallery very tellingly used he or she pronouns when they discussed who this assistant might be. This piqued my interest because I thought, my God, what does it mean to all of a sudden say that there's an assistant in a studio and that there's the possibility that there are sheep? And so, of course, that's something else is a branch of Vermeer scholarship that has gone wildly under underthought and under assimilated. And that's Benjamin Binstock's argument from Vermeer's Family Secrets about the fact that he has put forward that perhaps Vermeer's daughter was the painter. 
So I'm holding this off just for a second because I do want to talk about the National Gallery moment first, but there's no way it won't open out into the Binstock argument. So I'm curious what you both thought when you read that and what you thought when you saw the painting, knowing that the National Gallery no longer considers it a Vermeer. Yeah, so um, my recollection of the first once-in-a-lifetime exhibition, Vermeer exhibition that I saw, uh, is that the the, uh, woman in a red hat from the National Gallery, which is, as you say, one of the two tronies, they're exceptional in Vermeer's uh, of or uh, proposed of, in that they are also painted on panel. All the other accepted right. painting, Wood paintings panel. Are, on, yeah. are on canvas. And um, my recollection of the politics between the National Gallery in 1995-1996 and the Maritz House, which was the, the host of that Vermeer show in the Netherlands, was that at that time, uh, Arthur Wheelock, who was the chief curator of Dutch and Flemish painting, insisted, contrary to most other scholars, that the woman with the red hat was a Vermeer. The Dutch were not so sure, but that he essentially uh, bargained for, or that he, he the, the loans of the National Gallery paintings were, just to make a long story short, sort of leveraged on the acceptance by the Dutch of the attribution of the woman with the red hat. That is to say, and the girl with the flute was not included, if I recall correctly, because that's always been a question mark in in the studies of Vermeer. And so I was surprised that both of them were uh, were hung in the show, and not just in the show in the Hax Museum, but in the same room as the girl with the pearl earring. Which is, of course, uh, there is no other, uh, you know, great example of a trony by Vermeer. So what does that say to hang them on the wall that adjoins the wall on which the girl with the pearl earring hangs? I was also really surprised to learn through the documentary that was re- that was released uh, this year here in the Netherlands, the documentary called Close by Vermeer, uh, by Vermeer. That the National Gallery is there, mem- uh, representatives of the National Gallery, the curators are recorded in that documentary as saying, quote, Vermeer was not involved in the production of The Girl with the Flute, and, quote, we don't see a scenario in which this is Vermeer. No, I, I don't see another way of reading, you know, that's not really open for interpretation. Right. No. And this was there's no ambivalence no. in that statement. And this was none. This was spoken directly, both in Washington and in Amsterdam, as it's recorded in the documentary, to the curators of the Hague Museum. And notwithstanding this clear statement by, I might note, three women at the National Gallery, uh, had no seemed to have no make no impression on the curators of the Hague Museum. As you said, we'll talk about uh, Van Binstock's uh, ingenious and I think very important proposal, which has yet to be seriously taken up, as Lawrence has has, uh, reminded us in his wonderful recent article. Um, You know, we know of several instances of women, daughters generally, of artists who were trained at home, precisely because Guild regulations did not allow, in most cases, for uh, the registration of women artists. We know that many women trained uh, within the house rather than uh, through, let's say, the official auspices of, of registration as an apprentice in the guild. And we also know that Vermeer had many children. Uh, his wife gave birth to as many as 15. The argument that Ben Binstock has made for why some of the so-called Vermeers look different and attributing those to Maria seems to me to be quite convincing. So do you accept the NGA's reattribution? I mean, do you think Girl with a Flute is maybe not a Vermeer, but painted by someone close to Vermeer? Absolutely. But, you know, I don't okay. have that much. I don't have I, I don't have a, a the horse in this race or a dog in right. the game or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. Right. All you ha- all you have are, are eyes to see. 
And it's right. pretty obvious. Yeah. And, <laughs> I, and I think, and as I said, that painting has always been in question. What they right. did was to just um, make very explicit that they that they do not see a scenario in which it is a vermeer. And they made that explicit in conversations with the curators of an exhibition who were intent on, it seems, uh, leaving all matters of attribution aside. Right. Lawrence, what do you think? I actually went to the show in, at the National Gallery uh, and spoke to the curators and the scientists. They were saying, look at these two paintings, these two paintings. We know these are the only two paintings that were done on wood tap. And what's amazing, we have done analysis. And, and interestingly, the major argument that the Dutch had going for them was that there's no doubt that these two wood panel paintings, which are unlike any other paintings, all of Vermeer's oeuvre were done by the same person. And if you're going to say the red cat is what it, the same person would have done the other. So you are saying is that it's not only that the girl holding a flute might not be a Vermeer, yeah. but this extraordinary painting of the woman in the red hat might also not be a Vermeer. And I'm going to and go that further. These yeah. Two paintings might have been made by the same person. Right. Uh, because they are on wood panel and because they do, in fact, have a kind of brush stroke and paint application that is largely different from many of the other Vermeers right. in the show. Uh, what was very funny is that so that you have National Gallery saying one wasn't and one was. You have Reich's Museum saying they both had to have been by the same person, to which the answer is yes, they both were by the same person, not Vermeer. Right. And then you can go a step further. Now we're going to get close to Ben Stock's theory. As I left, I walked out of the building and I walked through the gift shop and the catalog for the entire National Gallery. This is the painting they think is the single greatest painting they have in the National Gallery. And I think maybe it is. It's the girl with a red hat. They're sure as hell not going to give that up. Oh, so we um, have this guy named Benjamin Binstock. And in 2009, he writes a book. Called, called family Vermeer's secrets. family secrets Vermeer's which, family secrets which parenthetically has on its cover the, the woman, woman with the red hat, the red hat. yeah now, now so let me just let me come into it just by saying uh what he says about those two paintings his general theory is that you can track Vermeer by who the subjects are that there's a continuous group of paintings that are about the wife but then he goes outside, he does the two paintings outside, that when he comes back in, the wife at this point has six, seven, eight children, is no longer able to pose. But he says that daughter, the eldest daughter, Maria, starting at the age of, he thinks, at, of 14, poses for one of them. And by the way, when we say poses, she's more standing into how the light flows. It's not exact, you know, but for the girl standing, looking at a necklace. That right. painting. He says that's Maria, and that looks different, and it does than all the other paintings that are Katrina, the mother. He said and says that she poses at the age of 16, and then when she's 17, she is painted in the girl with a pearl. But you also, in this case, arguably have a situation where the daughter, for three or four years at this point, has been with her father in the studio, has probably been mixing paints, that kind of right. insight of Tracy Chevalier's, I think is right, you know, and has been learning, has been watching, and specifically watched him paint her, and specifically watched him paint her there. Then what happens is that she, the argument is, does some, ex, some things with a wooden panel, uh, and, uh, on one wooden panel, it gets much better, and then does the next painting. And the extraordinary thing about the next painting, which is the girl with the red hat, which is one of the great paintings of all time, period. Mm -hmm. Yep. Everybody at home can do this. Take your Vermeer book and take the girl with the pearl in one hand in the mirror and then look at the girl with the red hat not in the mirror or flip it around. They're the same girl. And in right. fact, the, the, so in other words, what we're saying is that girl with the red hat is the same girl in the same pose as girl uh, with a pearl earring, the pearl but it's earring. reversed. And why would it be reversed? It's reversed because it's in a mirror because she's painting herself. Right. So the minute the National Gallery says, wait a second, we can prove scientifically that this one is not a Vermeer, uh, 
And then you have this other one that has all kinds of arguments for why, who, who it is. And in both cases, by the way, uh, they look like self-portraits rather than right. portraits. It's almost f forensic. In reading Binstock's account of Vermeer, yeah. one almost feels like when he's in a crime procedural, like the <laughs> yeah. degree of laying down like the pictures, the dating. I mean, and, and it's the much more thorough than anybody else. anything else. Yeah. But so I'd read this thing kind of when it came out. And I said, God, this is fantastic. I can't wait to see what people are going to say about it. And there was nothing. There was absolute silence. The book has not been reviewed. The book is included in the bibliography of the Rijksmuseum show, but it is never addressed directly, which is, it seems to me, extraordinary. And there is a very particular dynamic to the field itself. And that field is a field, and this is something that is very well represented by the documentary on the uh, Closer to Vermeer. It is a boys' club. It is a, it is a men's club. It is the, the, the curators, the dealers, the art historians tend to be and this is a bit of an exaggeration, but I'm just going to go there. They tend to be men who operate in the interest of preserving the values of golden age art, the mystery of Vermeer. I mean, for crying out loud, do we have to call him the Sphinx of Delft again, over and again and again? How many documents did John Michael Montillo's extraordinary economic historian, publish about Vermeer? Hundred. We know quite a lot about Vermeer. We know about the names of all of his children. We know about various incidents in the family. We know, I mean, there are so many things that we do know, but those, not unlike the figure of them, are, are kept at bay. In Ben's case, what I would say is that I, I, I feel this is a reflection on the nature of the subfield as much as it is on him. I don't think we can blame him. I mean, if he were in contemporary art, I can't imagine that he wouldn't be lionized for being an insurgent. What is at stake in excluding his views? You know, why is it so important to exclude his voice? The great thing we haven't said yet is money. That is the thing that's behind a lot of this. Reputation and money. Reputation of people who have made their reputation, saying this is, this isn't, whatever, and so on. And all, but also in the case of a few paintings that are in private hands, and specifically the one that shows up in the document, but there's this incredible scene where the owner, the current owner of, of quote, Vermeer's last painting. In private and hands. And one of the very few, it, is it the only painting in private hands at this juncture? As is... far as we know, yes. So it was bought by Steve Wynn for his Las Vegas Casino Museum. The minute that uh, Vermeer's Family Secret came out. Steve Wynn dumped it. He didn't want it anymore. It was bought by Thomas Kaplan, who has a thing called the Leiden Collection. I go to this show. I see these two paintings, the woman in the red hat, the girl with the flute. I know that they hang in the room with the girl with the pearl earring. I know Binstock's theory at this point. And I think to myself, they actually now mean more to me thinking that they might be by this young woman. What is it what is it about this proper name or our feel that we have so much invested in the idea that only one person could have made this body of work that we cannot imagine or let ourselves ponder that it could have been a family affair, that it could have been a studio practice, that a young woman could have made what Lawrence just said was one of the best paintings in the world. Like, why the resistance to this is outrageous to me. I kind of, because even at the level of like Hollywood, like, forgive me, but this is a good story. You know, like, this is a third act. This is like, this is real. This is Hollywood stuff. So what is the resistance? It's complicated, Helen. It's complicated because it would entail loosening the, the or just the museum store grip on the name 
it would entail thinking about the power of women and really thinking about the power of women. I also um, was surprised that there was really no attention to the, the, the manner in which women are represented mm. in Vermeer's work and the role of the men. What one tends to love about Vermeer is the extraordinary way in which he has depicted women. And if nothing else, these paintings are um, exquisite examples of beloved entities, right? And, you know, maybe there's a way in which the difficulty with accepting any deviation to the image of the beloved is, is what interferes with mm -hmm. um, uh, alternative interpretations, alternative attributions, you know, it's a sort of, but this is my beloved. I mean, there is a really profound attachment to these women as women. I had an undergraduate right years ago, write A beautiful essay about the girl with the pearl earring in which he said, seeing her is like seeing the love of your life, um, meeting the love of your life and forgetting to ask her name. And so, you know, this unbelievable investment, well, you know. Lawrence, you've written about the view of Delft that, I mean, you have a reading of that painting that is structured around absence, that the, that the landscape is essentially a landscape in which a building that once would have occupied the center sort of open space of the landscape is missing and that it's missing because it's an armory building that had blown up and burned down to the ground due to wartime activities. I, when the Twin Towers fell, I can't tell you how often I thought about that argument and how often I thought about that painting. And then I started, when all this came up about Maria and Binstock and everything, I couldn't help but think about Sadia Hartman's extraordinary book, Wayward Lives, and her idea of critical fabulations, that as a Black woman in the archive, what did she expect to find about other Black women in the archive? And that she had to fill in all the absences, all the gaps, because those absences and gaps were structural to the archive itself. Right. It's not in a, that's not that they're missing. It's that they, they can't be there and us still have the story we have about this country, for instance. And so I was curious about here we have, like, in my mind, one of the greatest readings of the view of Delft is yours, Lawrence's, which is about a structural absence. You know, we have an archive filled with absences. And yet we've got this guy somehow building Binstock, building a narrative in, in spite of or around those absences. Binstock is saying that not just two paintings, but eight paintings. Correct. Uh, are currently, that we currently think of, of as Vermeer's are in fact by Maria, including two of the three at the Frick, including two of the five at the, at the National Gallery, including two uh, at, at the Metropolitan Museum. In fact, all of them are in the United States, all the Maria Vermeers are in the United States. One of the things that Maria does all the time is she really looks you in the eye. That hardly ever happens in Vermeer's paintings, that, except with, for the girl with a, uh, with a pearl earring. But she, all of her paintings, you have the girl looking up and looking you in the eye. There are several paintings that all have this girl with a high forehead, kind of bulging eyes, curls. Those are the sister, according to Binstock, the next sister, Lisbeth. And that Lisbeth is the person that she, uh, Maria, keeps painting over and over again. And, and he does a few too. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in, in the years ahead. We will never know for sure. But at this stage, I would say that the, that the weight of the argument is on Binstock's side and not on the other side. And they at least have to answer these things and give up and not say things like, oh, he has no evidence. And right. he has the evidence of his eyes, of our eyes. Claudia, what about, how do you situate yourself as someone who teaches in the discipline this thing that 
about guessing and not being sure and archives being predicated on absences. How do you, how do you um, conduct yourself um, in, in such terrain? I mean, thank you for such an unbelievably rich question. <laughs> it's a privilege. Um, so I, I would take the question into possibly opposing, but not, um, yeah, two opposing directions. One is to think about the role of absence and ambiguity in the paintings themselves, and to think about that as one of the prime features in my estimation, of their art. Now, the other direction I would take the question in is a museological direction, and that is looking at the recent uh, pattern of exhibitions at the museum and thinking about what was at stake for the next museum in this blockbuster, internationally widely celebrated and hugely attended uh, show that asked us in all of the subtitles and the documentary and the literature to be to to come closer to Vermeer, to uh, to look closely, to see more. If we look at that this exhibition and the way that it was presented, the way it was installed, the way it was offered to us, in view of recent uh, exhibitions, I find it incredible incredibly striking that it came more or less on the heels of one of the most profound, historically informed, narratively structured, and deeply important shows that the Hanks Museum has ever put on, the exhibition in 2020, Slavery, hmm. which was a, a, an exhibition organized around 10 narratives giving by way of a kind of museological critical fabulation, giving uh, uh, biographies to individuals. It in, involved uh, contemporary works by contemporary artists as well, and it, it really reflected on the role of the museum vis-a-vis -vis that subject. And so I see the Vermeer show as, you know, as in a certain sense, this gigantic point of absence following that really profound gesture on the part of the Higgs Museum, and a, a kind of, um, I think, also in some respect, a reactionary return to conventional values. You know, it's enough to just look and love these pictures, these women, as depicted by this man. Wow. So can I extrapolate from what you just said that the critical methodology offered by Sadia Hartman's Wayward Lives, which is critical fabulation, which I think Binstock in a way engages in uh, before it's given a name, that's something that can be applied to certain histories, but not the history of the production of white male geniuses. Uh -huh. I, I, uh, the, way I would, <laughs> the way I would say that is that all criticism is fabulation. I'm sort of obsessed with thinking about Binstock and Sadia Hartman in concert with one another in no measure, in no small measure, because what they both put forward is the idea that women, particularly young women, just might be worth listening to, <laughs> just might be doing things that they weren't supposed to be doing or weren't expected to be doing. And so for me, the Vermeer show kind of, I, I, it left me in that frame of mind. I'm really, really grateful to both of you for entertaining this line of questioning and conversation today on the podcast. So Lawrence and Claudia, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Helen, thank you. Thank you so much. Dialogues is produced by David Zwerner. If you like this episode, please follow, rate, and review us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It really does help the show. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you join us here next time.